All right. Hello, everyone. I'm J.S. Garrett, and I have a very special guest with me here today to talk about some very interesting things, Mr. J.A. Ragnarsson. How you doing, J.A.? What's up, man? Uh, not much, man. It's a pleasure to have you on. I guess we'll just jump right into it here. Uh, you and I have collaborated quite a bit about the right of deification which was published in the Anthology Sorcery, Volume 3, recently. And we have performed this right for each other. And so we're just going to jump on and talk a little bit about our experiences with that ritual, both being the operator as well as the recipient. But uh, before we get into that, I'd like uh, to invite you to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, how you got started within your practice and what your main focus is. Cool, yeah. Um, I started out as kind of a right-hand path guy. I was like a Christian mystic for a long time. And one thing led to another. Um, had a falling out with that. Ended up as kind of a, well, I identify as a heathen. Uh, I'd always in my life felt this weird connection with Odin and the Norse pantheon. And so when I left the church, that's where I gravitated to. Um, got introduced to books like the Kabbalion, started studying the occult, and that evolved into a kind of a Norse magic practice. So now at this point, I'm kind of in a much darker kind of path. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into how, how that evolved, but, but the right of deification played a huge part in that shift from from kind of gravitating towards the left-hand path from the right hand. So uh, I have a YouTube channel under the name J.A. Ragnarsson. Um, you can find me on Facebook, things like that. Other than that, that's all that's interesting about me. <laughs> well, uh, that is actually pretty interesting. Um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people, and uh, – Several several people that I have talked to uh, have come from a, a Christian background. Um, you know, not only you know in this society are we mainly raised to be Christians, but uh, I noticed that a lot of people who have a strong calling in the left hand path actually started out in the right hand path or in the church. Uh, a friend of mine uh, studied to be a minister for years until he he realized that that was not for him, and now he's a uh, full-on left-hand practitioner, and uh, a very good one as well. His name is uh, Curtis Joseph. Uh, you guys have probably seen quite a few videos that he and I have done together, but uh, yeah, I find that that interesting how how we we tend to feel that that deep calling, you know, that internal calling, and it kind of takes a little while to find our niche, I guess you could say, because uh, there's, there's so much distortion out there and everything that is left-hand path is very demonized and, and shunned away from. So it usually takes like a, a major life crisis or change in order to set one upon their appropriate path. You know, is that something that you've experienced? I mean, did, was there was there like a defining moment where where everything went to shit and you just out of complete necessity dove in head first to the left hand path? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, I have a similar background. I studied to be a minister. All of that. I was never that like Sunday morning Christian kind of guy. I, I was hardcore with with my spirituality, one hundred percent dedicated. And then I just had some some serious shit go down in my life like that defining moment and i threw it all away and i said i'm done with this and um kind of a weird series of events led me to to that search and i spent about 18 months kind of wandering not practicing anything other than meditation and uh, energy work and things like that. I, I didn't claim any kind of religion or ideology or really consistent practice. I was just studying everything that was out there trying to find what was my thing. Um, I studied the, the religions of the world, all of the different occult systems, systems of magic. Um, and I just ended up where I am kind of by 
by synchronicity, I guess. So, yeah. Well, yeah, that's, uh, I appreciate you sharing that information with us there. It's, it's always very interesting for me to, to hear how different people came to be on this path. So you also work very closely with the being known as Shimyaza, correct? Yes. Very um, at this time, that's the entity that I'm working most closely with, uh, okay. along with the other watchers, but primarily Shimyaza. Very cool. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because honestly, other than myself, I don't know many people who have worked with this being at all. And I find it very peculiar that out of all the, the watchers that we do know of, uh, he's one of the, he's, he seems to be the one we know the, mo the least about. I mean, everyone knows who Azazel is. Everyone is familiar with his sigil and his specialties and what he does. But whenever you Google Shimyaza, I mean, almost nothing at all comes up. And all we really, all we really see about him in the, the book of Enoch is that, uh, you know, they, that he was declared the spokesman for the watchers and that he taught root work and sorcery. You don't really hear anything else about him. And so I think that that could be that, or that it could be that he was intentionally wiped out of history because he might be the number one threat to the power structure. And uh, that is because of the information that he may possess. Uh, uh, some people have called him the knower of the name, which uh, that's been interpreted as the one that, you know, the, the secret name of God that he supposedly was able to give to someone that they could use that information to ascend to Godhood themselves. Now, I think, have found through my own personal working with him that that might be slightly misinterpreted. I believe that is plural, as in he is the knower of the names, as in he is the one who can give you your true name or your God name. And that is what knower of the name of God means. Uh, have you, I mean, what, what do you think about that? Have you found anything similar in your path working? Um, yeah, I think through through institutions like the church, things get perverted pretty, pretty regularly. Um, and then there's the whole thing of these ancient languages changing through time and being misinterpreted, being mistranslated. Um, but through personal experience, um, Shimyaza definitely seems to be, to not fit the mythology to not fit the, uh, the stigmas that, that have been placed. Um, and knower of the name of God doesn't really seem to fit him at all. <clears throat> For me, he, he looks deep within you and he knows who you truly are. And he seeks to show you that, which is kind of what sorcery and magic is all about. Um, he, has, he has been leading me to face all of the things, all of the self limitations that I placed on myself and to strip away all of those um, false identity things that, that I've had, you know? Um, so that definitely fits from my experience. Very cool. Very cool. Um, Plural. Yeah. 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 It seems uh, that he's able to give us that information and, uh, I, I, like I said before, I think the fact that he holds that that secret information about each individual is probably why he was intentionally wiped from history. But uh, I also think he's making a comeback in a very big way. And uh, he is the being that channeled me the right of deification, which seems to be a very key factor in awakening this inner godhood within people. Now, you heard about this and felt compelled to reach out to me. And you actually... You, you sent me a video um, that, or it was more of a video of you discussing it after the fact, where you actually performed this uh, with some other people. And so after seeing that you were actually willing to, to get your hands dirty and perform this ritual, you and I agreed to perform this right for each other. And uh, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about that experience, uh, with both your experience being the recipient as well as being the operator. Um, so I guess, uh, 
if, if you could start out telling us about your experience uh, with the operation, being the evocator, uh, what was what was that like for you? It was the most incredible experience I've ever had uh, with any kind of spiritual practice. Um, from the start of it, I was very nervous the first time that I performed it because I was doing something I'd never done. I'd never evoked a uh, human spirit and I'd never worked with Shimyaza. But, but from listening to you talk about it, you know, he was the spirit you channeled it through. I felt compelled to call upon him to lead me through the ritual. So I did that. And again, I've never um, performed sacrifice in that way before either for another, for human recipient. So all of these factors, things that I've never done before in this one ritual, um, and you would think that you would kind of stumble through it, but I didn't. I, I invoked Shinyaza, and it was like something just took over. My hands knew what to do. You know, uh, I knew exactly what to do. And it was kind of like stepping out of my body and watching someone else perform this right. That's why it was so significant for me, because it was so, so incredible, so moving. The elements responded throughout. When I called Chinyaza, all of the coyotes in the vicinity just went nuts. And that's happened every time I've done the ritual. Um, I tried to record the first one on camera. The camera shut off halfway through with no explanation. Battery was fully charged. You know, there was no reason that should have happened. And I like to circumambulate. So as I'm walking around the fire and chanting, you know, the things, calling Shimyaza forth and, and then later calling the human recipient forth, the smoke and the flames are following me around the circle. Um, just, just so much of nature and, and the elements getting involved in the ritual, it was like, it was like everything was perfect. It was like I was supposed to be there in that place in that time. And so I called the human recipient. And when he arrived, the, the flames kind of began to dance and, and grow higher. And it felt as though there were others there with him. And I think that's something that you've experienced also when you call a human spirit forth, the spirits that are attached with them maybe their guides and their guardians, ancestors, things like that, tend to come with them. And then, um, so I did what I needed to do um, and dismissed the, the recipient. Just, even as the operator, you're going to receive some of that life force energy. Because I was like pulsating with, with energy when this was happening. So I dismiss the recipient and I'm left to deal with Shinyaza, uh, a spirit I'd never evoked before, never even, never even studied much of his mythology. Um, so we just hit it off and, and we talked. And I made other offerings during that rite to, to the gatekeepers. But something about Shinyaza was calling to me. So, so after I left that rite, I ended up making a pact with him. Um, then again, when I perform the right with you, same thing, the elements respond, nature is going crazy, the energy, it's something undeniable when you take part in this, that you know, it's almost as if it goes beyond synchronicity, beyond any kind of psychological response that you're having. You just, you just know, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's definitely something that's hard to explain and put into words. Um, the the type of experience that this uh, that this is the 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 energetic fluctuations, the uh, the the way the elements respond, and what it awakens within within the operator is uh, very difficult to describe. And uh, it's something I've been trying to describe for a long time, and I don't feel like I've ever fully fully uh, grasped or been able to to describe to others what this is like 
and it it really it feels like a very ancient type of ritual i mean you really you feel like you really connect to the very essence of magic itself in a very primal way like you feel connected to the air to the fire to the elements to the animals and each time i've done this right and uh i've got many many videos of me performing this ritual each time any animal that happens to be in the general vicinity goes crazy i mean roosters down the road are crowing every dog within a mile around me goes nuts coyotes uh, usually uh, have things like owls show up they'll they'll fly up into the trees this this actually happened during during your ritual uh, an owl flew up into the the tree next to me and uh, sat there and, and and made noises throughout the entire ritual and I found that no no two rituals are exactly alike um, as you were saying before whenever I evoke a person there's almost always other spirits that show up with them that uh, seem to be attached to that person or, or, you know, spirit guides, guardians, things of that nature. And I, I think this, uh, this should really give people comfort because uh, I've, I've never had a negative experience with this, but I had theorized that this technique of evoking people could also be utilized for baneful purposes. And, uh, it gives me great comfort to know that whenever someone evokes me, that an entire army goes with me. And it's like, it's like that, that triggers something, you know, these other spirits, uh, you know, all time is present for them and, and they seem to, you know, nothing, nothing is hidden from them. So whenever someone is evoking you, these other spirits that watch over and protect you are going to escort you to and from the ritual space. And that is to ensure that, uh, that you are safe during this experience. Uh, I think they provide protection. I think they hold protection for the recipient while they are out of body because that is a vulnerable state. And uh, I also uh, do quite a lot of uh, preliminary rituals to evoke protection for not only myself, but the recipient as well. So there's a lot that goes into this ritual. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's over the top, man. It's, uh, it's definitely hard to, to put a good description on it because it is so elaborate and, and in depth. And one of the things that um, happened when I evoked you, I mean, not only did you show up with an entire legion, it seemed like I could literally hear footsteps behind me and in the woods around me. Uh, like I said, there was an owl that showed up, there were dogs barking, there were roosters crowing. I mean, just all kinds of shit was happening. And it was a clear sky when I went out there. There was no forecast for rain or anything like that in my area. And towards the end of the ritual, when I placed the sacrifice upon the flame and was giving your spirit time to absorb that energy, it starts raining for about five minutes. And as soon as the rain started to pour, the camera shut off at the very end of the ritual. So, uh, I also had a full battery uh, at that time, and there was no explanation for either one of those things. And as soon as I dismissed your spirit and closed out the ritual, the rain stopped, and uh, it did not. It did not rain again. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, it's it's really crazy how the elements respond. And uh, I've also found that when I go through these videos frame by frame, I will see faces in the flames. And uh, that's that's really cool, too, because it's so it's so profound um, to, to see a face in the flames that actually resembles the person you're evoking. I mean, that's undeniable proof to me, at least, that uh, we are, in fact, uh, doing something here. We're not just we're not just playing games. You know, this uh, this is very real and it has a very real effect on on the recipient. So. Whenever you evoked me, I um, I fell asleep pretty quickly as you were beginning this ritual. And I woke up about two hours later feeling very disoriented, which is normal. It's normal to feel kind of disoriented about for about 30 minutes, you know, once you wake up. And, you know, I got up, I went to the bathroom, I was stumbling around the house, and I went and I laid back down with the intention of going back to sleep but that, that did not happen. I started feeling the energy 
begin to transfer into my physical body. And at that point, I was wide awake and uh, pinging off the walls for, uh, for quite a while. So did you have that experience as well? Yeah, pretty much all of that. Um, for me, the disorientation, I'm going to go back to the first time I had this right done. Um, about an hour and a half before the operator started the ritual, I started to feel the effects. It was kind of like being on drugs, uh, like a dissociative. And I started to feel really, really sluggish and tired, and I just went ahead and laid down. Um, and I felt that way the next day also. Um, and all three times I've had this done, it's been the same effect. I start to feel really tired and disoriented, like I couldn't stay awake if I wanted to, um, right before it starts. And that gave me the thought that when you make significant changes in your energy body and your physical body through these kinds of means, that it sends shock waves forward and backwards in time and it, it kind of steps outside of time and begins to affect you. Um, but it usually takes me about a day to recover and kind of readjust to the, to the new energy. Um, and then the next day I'll wake up at 4 a.m. before my alarm goes off and I'll be ready to go. And I'm, I'm kind of like a energy drink junkie. So, that's a big deal for me to wake up before my alarm and be just ready to go. I'll start getting ready. Um, I'll be full of energy, be to the point where I can't go to sleep at night, um, but I won't need to. It's just a huge change. And I've noticed a lot of um, increase in libido, which is a, an, another major use for this ritual, I think, that that it kind of supercharges that, your sex drive and, and all of that. But definitely, man, um, the disorientation can kind of be confusing, especially the next day when you feel like it's been done and you should, you should be feeling the effects, but, but you'll, you'll adjust. And um, I wouldn't worry too much about that for anyone that's, that's having it done. It, that's a sign that it's working. So yeah. yeah absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, what you were talking about, like, uh, with vitality and stuff being increased, uh, that's, that's something that's been reported back to me across the board. Um, this right seems to affect different people in different ways. Um, it seems to trigger changes within people, you know, a transformational change that is slightly different for each person. But the thing that is reported across the board is an increase in overall energy, an increase in sex drive, as well as health and vitality. And uh, I've actually been using this to treat chronic pain recently. Um, I found that whenever, whenever I have the spirit of the recipient present, I am able to give them instructions as to what to do with that energy once they carry it back to their physical body. And so uh, I had a lady not too long ago who was suffering from chronic back pain. And I performed the deification rite for her. And once I had her present, I instructed her spirit to utilize all of that energy to, to channel all that energy into her, into her back of her physical body with the intention of relieving that chronic pain. And the next day she was pain free and she's been pain free ever since. So, uh, it's, it's been a couple of months now and she's still doing good from that. So, I mean, I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I channeled this ritual and, and published this ritual, but I'm, I'm still figuring out exactly what all can be done with this. I mean, it seems to have so many applications and different things that can be used for that I really think the sky is the limit. And uh, that's a big part of why I put this out there is uh, because not only does it encourage people to work together, but it also encourages people to get creative with this and uh, create new techniques or find new uses for it. And so uh, I want to, I want to thank you personally for, for being willing to get your hands dirty. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of magicians out there that uh, talk a big game, but when it comes down to, you know, making a animal sacrifice or spending five hours to set up a ritual space outdoors, uh, they just don't have the, what it, what it takes to put forth that kind of effort. So I, I do greatly appreciate that. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that you're also doing this with others because that is, the, that is the whole point of this ritual. 
and rituals like this is uh, for us to come together and make each other stronger. And this is a big way that we can do that. And it's, it's also a way that we can improve our skills at evocation and things like that because we're getting feedback from living subjects. You know, right. we're not doing the ritual with a spirit and then sitting back waiting for the result to manifest to figure out whether or not it worked. Uh, when you do the right, I mean, it either worked or it didn't. You'll know instantly the next day they will be feeling the effects instantly. And being able to talk to the person afterwards and record that information uh, greatly, greatly helps the operator improve their, their ritual practices altogether. So, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing that with us for sure. Well, thanks, man. Um, my first recipient reported a lot of increase in psychic abilities and um, being able to see and experience manifestations with spirits. And I also experienced the same. Um, there were some abilities that I'd kind of lost or maybe lost potency with, and they have been restored to me through this. Um, so I'm happy to come on and report on that, man. When when people hear the feedback, that's what's going to compel people to work together and make each other stronger because we there's this path of self-development and self-transformation, but we can help each other in this path. Uh, I've had several people reach out to me, though, and like you said, a lot of people are not willing to put in the work. They just want something quick and uh, snap your fingers and kind of make it happen. This this right does take a lot of preparation. And like you, I also do a lot of preparatory work to make sure that it's safe for the recipient as well as myself. Because uh, blood sacrifice is going to attract a lot of attention in the spirit world. Um, I noticed the first time that I did this that outside of the circle there was all kind of activity and I had called the gatekeepers to hold space. That's absolutely necessary. Um, another thing, when you mentioned the painful potential of this, is I like to call upon, or I like to ask the recipient, who is the primary entity that you feel close to? I will call him to, him or her, to guide you safely to and from your body, uh, you know, and hold space over the ritual as well. So I feel 100% safe in this right once I've spoken with someone and kind of gotten to know them a little bit. I don't see a lot of potential for this going wrong if, if the operator is competent. Absolutely. However, there are a lot of uses for this. I've, I've started to use evocation of the recipient for other kinds of rights, like breaking addictions, uh, healing, and I've seen exponential results. The recipients have reported instant results with it, even without the sacrifice. So there's endless potential with this thing. Um, and I myself have used this to break an addiction. I haven't talked about this a lot, but I, I was a drug addict when I was younger. And I had used uh, a prescription drug to, to act as a replacement kind of for that addiction and right before i had this right performed i stopped taking that drug and the physiological effects of stopping that drug were just horrendous and i had the right performed and when i when i first began to feel the energy transfer it was kind of like i could feel the the energy coursing through my body and kind of pushing out that kind of negativity, it's, it's, it's difficult to explain. But in the days after, I instantly began to recover. My energy level began to come back. Um, the body aches and all of that went away. So it's absolutely, absolutely can be used for things like drug addiction and other kinds of addictions, caffeine addiction, sugar addiction. I have a friend that I performed an evocation for that um, he was trying to get kind of in a healthy diet and exercise, get in the gym, and he couldn't stop eating sugar. Like, 
horrible foods. So I performed an evocation for him, called him forth, made an offering, and dismissed him back to his body, told his spirit or astral body what, instructed his astral body what to do, and sent him back. And within the next few days, he reported that the cravings were gone. So even, even mundane things like that that you don't really think about, it, it's possible to use this for that as well. That is awesome, dude. That is absolutely awesome. And uh, yeah, dude, it's, uh, I mean, when you're working with someone's God self, um, yeah, I think the possibilities are endless with that because, uh, I mean, this even seems to trump hypnosis. I mean, because that's, that's essentially what they're trying to do whenever, whenever someone goes to undergo hypnosis to quit smoking or something like that. They're trying to reprogram that behavior in their, in their mind. I mean, because uh, all, all of reality exists within our minds and uh, everything is internal as well as external. And so by evoking someone's God self and, and simply giving them instructions to stop a behavior or to improve on something, then it implants that in their subconscious and their, their God self seems to, to kind of take over and make those changes for them which is very beneficial on, on so many levels. I mean, helping someone, you know, like, like you were saying, just, you know, stop eating, you know, bad foods. I mean, that's, uh, people, you know, they, they don't realize how important, you know, operations like that can be or how effective they can be. So, I mean, I feel like this really bypasses uh, a lot of other therapeutic treatments as well, if you use it in this manner. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's awesome, dude. Uh, I command you for or, or commend you for uh, experimenting with this and, and getting creative and, and getting results. That's that's absolutely over the top awesome. So, have you something that I've been working on developing or or more more or less deciphering is the different effects that utilizing different creatures for sacrifice in this manner will have on a person. I, I think that using different animals or human blood um, from different people can, it, it seems to open different doors within people. So the next experiment I'm gearing up to do is actually with a serpent. I typically do this with, uh, with game birds, such as chickens, roosters, quail, things of that nature, things that I can obtain easily from a sale barn that are, that are raised for food and can be consumed. And uh, I, I think that utilizing different, different animals with different totem values could have different effects on a person. So have you experimented with that at all, or is that something you've considered doing? I've considered it, but at this point, I haven't had the chance to pursue that. At this point, I've only used my own blood and game birds. I've used hens and roosters. Um, but that's something I am strongly considering. I just wanted to see what I could do with the ritual by the book, the way you described it. And now that I've been successful with it, um, I plan on pursuing that. I live, I live in the middle of nowhere. There's lots of animals around. I could go in the woods and catch a snake. And that serpent archetype kind of energy would probably have a different effect, I think. So, yeah, I, I think so too. And uh, I also uh, have the pleasure of living out in the middle of nowhere and could uh, very easily go out and catch a snake as well. So uh, yeah, I think that's the next experiment you and I should do uh, together is to uh, get a couple of decent sized snakes and perform this ritual and see what the difference is between using serpents and uh, roosters. Because serpent energy is very, very powerful. I mean, if you evoke the spirit of the king snake, like, holy shit, you'll be shocked and surprised at what shows up. Yeah. So, yeah, it is also a universal symbol of healing and wellness. You know, the serpent, even the, even the little symbol on the back of the ambulance has the two serpents crawling up the pole. You know, that's a very, very universal symbol of healing. So, yeah, I think I anticipate this is going to have a very profound effect that is uh, different from uh, using the game birds. So, uh, yeah, I say, we, I say we do that experiment as soon as possible. I'm down, bro. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, we've got 
a few more minutes here. Is there anything else you want to cover? Um, you, you do Ritual for Hire now, correct? Yeah, I've made that available now. I'm still building the website, but anyone that wants to reach out to me can find me on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, I've made a link available in a few of my YouTube videos, but right now that's under construction. But all they'd have to do is reach out to me and we can discuss that. So, all right. Very cool. Very cool. Well, if anyone would like to hire myself to perform the right of deification for them in the event that uh, you live in the city or something like that, uh, that's, that's typically the, the types of customers that I get or, or other magicians that uh, are combined, confined by the area that they live. Uh, this does require privacy and an outdoor ritual space. So uh, if you live in the middle of New York City, it's, it's not really going to be feasible to, to do this in your apartment complex. Um, so uh, you, can, you, can, you can employ my services at becomealivinggod.com. And uh, we also have a new clothing line that just came out through becomealivinggod.com. So if you would like a super cool t-shirt like what I'm wearing here, then uh, definitely check out Become a Living God's catalog. Uh, they have many, many designs as well as... Uh, tank tops and hats and things of that nature with different uh, sigils of uh, different spirits on them. So that's, that's very cool. Check that out. And uh, yeah, I want to, I want to thank you for coming on and chatting with me today, J.A. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, I really appreciate you being willing to do this, man, for, for being, for being innovative and willing to get your hands dirty and being creative, you know, utilizing this technique to achieve different things. Uh, I think that's uh, something we don't see enough of in the occult community these days. And we certainly don't see a lot of people working together. We mainly see people fighting amongst themselves, which is 100% counterproductive as to what we're trying to do here. We're uh, trying to come together and make some very needed changes in the world. So I greatly appreciate seeing that behavior from you, sir. So uh, thank you. Thank you, man. All right, brother. Well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you this evening, and uh, we will definitely be getting on here to uh, talk about the results of our next experiment very soon. Till next time, bro. Till next time. You have a great night, bro.